is actually as more like a refugee station for people who don't quite fit anywhere else, or people who have, have had lives in other denominations but have found elements of it not quite the correct or quite their expression through time. Uh, particularly the modern Anglican Church really has become that place of refuge for people who have been kind of burned or found other denominations too narrow or too broad in certain different dimensions. So it's become kind of uh, an indefined uh, expression that, that covers a multitude of different understandings and, and practices, such that even within the city of Napier, or this, the Hawke's Bay is maybe a better example of it, you can come to our 10 a.m. service, which is very low church, uh, very little in the practice of um, historic sort of rituals and elements, but still components of liturgy, through to going to St. Luke's and Havelock North, which on a given Sunday, uh, Father John, the vicar there, much more high church. So it will be a ritualized practice that will look very much like the church did prior to the Reformation in many ways in terms of practice. The difference being, of course, it's in English, probably. And then in between that, you can come to a place like St. Matthew's and Hastings, which is typically or traditionally called Broad Church, which is kind of tastes of the traditional and the Catholic appearances, while also degrees of informality and other elements. And then you can go to the cathedral and experience choral mass and the sort of the heights of Anglican cathedral worship, which kind of fit into its own little niche area as well. So even in the Hawke's Bay, you have this breadth of expression of what Anglican means, that is quite hard to pin down. Now the best way to do it at least, or the, the way we've attempted to do it in the past, is to look at these categories which are up on the whiteboard here, uh, which is captured in the language of Reformed on one side and Catholic on the other, and then in this other spectrum of High Church through to Low Church. To give you a really basic kind of definition of these, Reformed is usually captured in the language of the Reformation. It tends to be an emphasis on salvation by grace and no works involved, trying to under downplay that. It also tends to downplay the ritual of worship. So it tends to have a bit more of a disposition towards, in, well, not informality, but more from the heart, um, expressed in the moment, and a lot less uh, pomp and ceremony, you might say. So if you're extremely on the reform side, it's unlikely you'll like candles. It's unlikely you'll like robes, and it's unlikely that you will like liturgy. That tends to be the reformed side of the church. The Catholic side of the church, and this is a bit of a fraught title, because uh, it's kind of, there is small c Catholic, which just literally means universal. So we're all Catholic in that sense. When we use the capital C, what we're typically reforming, we're referring to is the Catholic church in what's called the Western Rite, or the Roman Rite. So the way that the Roman Catholic Church worships. And usually in that you have a height of liturgical practice and sort of you know, action and pomp and ceremony that sometimes actually makes more complicated the message that's trying to get across rather than clarify that there's history, there's tradition, there's drama, there's sort of almost a degree to which it's like a, a lived worship play. Uh, you are, yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of a theological distinction we'll come to in a few weeks. But in terms of Catholic practice, typically robes, lots of candles, probably a bit of incense, a lot of ritualized action and careful considered movements within a service. So if you think of Reformed, you might think Baptist. Uh, you might even think of Pentecostal non-denominational. That tends to be Reformed in its worship. If you think Catholic, you're thinking Anglo-Catholic in terms of the Anglican side, but Roman Catholic Mass would be the kind of model on that side of it. Really depends on what it really means is where you're rooting back your sense of what worship is. Catholic people, or the Catholic end, tends to think worship is validated by its history. So if the church has been using that form for a long time, it's good. The reform tide tends to play on more the idea of the degree to which you are inspired or drawn or converted in heart or mind through the act of worship. So it tends to be about almost a, an efficacious worship versus a, a sort of a historic worship. It's sort of a, a way in which you can make that distinction. Some Anglican churches do have the um, incense. Absolutely, yep. I've had to do it a few times before. 
Um, so okay. we'll, that, that's where we're going to come to in a moment. <laughs> Sorry, but this, this spectrum is sort of your theological disposition. Then this spectrum tends to be your, your practice disposition. So very high church um, is, is typically, at least in, in the vernacular language of this, it would normally mean a lot of roving. So if you've ever seen me in the chasubles and things, everything on, uh, at a high church service that would be worn every single Sunday, there would be highly likely to be incense as well as, as candles, a, a mass of candles, literally, uh, and a lot of deliberate process through a liturgy. Low church, on the other hand, tends to emphasise informality, uh, tends to be more like a family gathering, uh, uh, almost like the level of a barbecue kind of thing, not necessarily very well organised, uh, not necessarily very well thought through, uh, low church can be just sort of in the spirit of the moment, led by the spirit is the language that I tend to use in that moment, but it, it tends to be in terms of an oppositional form where there's form and structure and practice, there tends to be informality, uh, a lot of looseness and less rigour around who's doing what and when uh, in terms of the low church practice. Now in this, there are not many people that fall into this category in this window. There are not many high church reformed people or churches, and there's not many people that fit into this window either, the low church Catholic. The best kind of examples of it tend to be, if you were to look down here, if you know any charismatic Catholics. So charismatic Catholics often fall down in this sort of space. They're quickly seen. They tend to have, because of that kind of the Holy Spirit guide, they tend to get rid of some of the, the ritualised practice of the Mass and be a little bit more loose about what they're doing. They're still very much guided and structured by it, but a bit more loose about it. Likewise, Reformed in High Church is quite rare, um, but it does happen in Anglican cathedrals sometimes. So uh, some places like Liverpool Cathedral used to be an example of this. Um, it's less so now but under different deans it sort of has that guide where there's a, there's a rigour around the practice of worship, so right angles by clergy and everything very ordered and very carefully laid out, as well as incense and other elements, but the actual theological disposition of the service emphasises a degree of, of grace as well as um, a, a, a personal sense of relationship with Jesus over and above the kind of church relationship with Jesus that comes on the other side of it. So it does happen, but they're pretty rare, um, because usually churches tend to fall in a spectrum going this way. Now, in terms of the, the classic example, you'd be looking here at, um, I mean, the, the best example of this would be literally um, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, <laughs> in terms of high church and Catholic. That is the, the, the heartbeat. But even within the Roman Catholic Church, there would be disagreements about that because um, the Roman Catholic Church in St. Peter's still uses the vernacular language. And there's still a big argument within the Roman Catholic Church about whether Latin Mass should be what's offered as a sort of definition of tradition. So you can kind of put it up here as well to just say the Latin Mass would be a classic example of it, which can take up to an hour and a half. It's a very procedural thing. And congregationally, there's not that much to do. <laughs> You're really an observer and a, and a watcher of this action that the priest does on your behalf with God. So there's this high church sort of um, Roman Catholic dimension there. Low church reformed, it, it's hard to kind of capture the, the essence of this, but typically if you go to any general Baptist church, you would capture low church reformed. So it's normally <laughs> So in those sort of uh, categories, these are your extremes, typically speaking, in each of those windows. As I said, not many that really fall into these, because they tend to go across the spectrum this way. Now the question, I guess, is where in your experience of the Anglican Church, whether it's been a long experience or a short experience, or even within different churches that you've experienced within the Anglican Church, where do you think some of them might fit in this grid of, of practice and belief? 
I think there is a lot because when we went from there, I did the quite a few services in the Anglican Church yep. because they were that was yeah the they needed some leaders. <laughs> So, yeah, there is. I mean, there's a, a massive divergence of practice within the Anglican Church. Um, so, Alan, where is uh, All Saints under you? Uh, it depends on which service you go to. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm watching that at home. So yeah, I don't so, necessarily um, in terms of uh, In terms of the 10 a.m. service, we would probably be somewhere around here. In terms of lower church practice, less roving, less sort of rituals within the actions, but still very shaped by the liturgy. I mean, the, the words, all that we're using is still shaped by the liturgy, just exercised informally, informally. And, I mean, All Saints, by and large, has a longer history with sort of the evangelical stream of Anglicanism, which tends to be on the Reformed side. So it would probably sit around here. Uh, in terms of the 8 a.m. service, it depends a little bit. Um, sorry, in there. Um, it probably is a lot more, in terms of its practice, heading towards um, a little bit more of a Catholic sort of intuition um, and a little bit higher church practice that so probably sits a bit further along here. Um, primarily based, partly based on me, but partly based on history and just expression in general. Um, in terms of, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't ever go up here. Again, <laughs> um, had to do it at the cathedral, and it's just not my style. And it, to be, I don't think it's many people's here. Um, so there is a degree to which this this spectrum is very much just a, a personal preference situation. Some people find, you know, that the, the ritualized dynamic a really a, a nice thing to fall into uh, and find it really easy, whereas others find it very off-putting. This side tends to be a little bit more informed by the theological disposition of the priest as well as by the congregation's history. So by and large, I fall on the reform side of the theological spectrum, not as informed by the kind of the, the Catholic heritage and sense of the Roman Catholic Church's teaching into the church. Um, but then again, there's other Anglican priests literally within the region who would fall far further over here and far further up here, um, but they're all still within that kind of Anglican ethos. Now, the main reason I wanted to do this is to say that actually it, it's nearly impossible to define Anglicanism by its practice. The, the fact that the Anglican Church does not get nicely put into a category like this. Uh, you can be a Reformed Low Church Anglican, you can be a High Church Catholic Anglican, you can be a, a Catholic Low Church Anglican, and you can be a High Church Reformed Anglican, and you can be everywhere in the middle. Typically the Anglican Church tries to fall somewhere here, and we tend to use the title Broad Church which means it's, it's, it's as embracing of different traditions as possible. But the, the reality is that this sort of way of defining church does not work for Anglicanism. It falls over for us. Now, it can work, by and large, for most denominations. So if you're talking about the Baptist church, I can almost guarantee you 80% of the time it's going to be around here. If you're talking about the uh, Pentecostal church, I can tell you 90% it's going to be down here. If you're going to talk about the Roman Catholic Church, I can tell you that about 80% of the time it's going to be somewhere up in here. Um, but Anglicanism is a harder thing to, to place on the spectrum because actually 
the the definitives or the the distinctives of our church haven't so much to do with the external dimensions of worship as they do with the the sort of the, the, the philosophy and the drive behind the practice. And that's why it's important that we start, start this conversation about being Anglican by looking at the question of devotion. So how we worship says something about who we are. And the fact that you can't define it particularly easily is a very deliberate thing. And it's a product of our history. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start you with a question and then I'm going to give you a very, very big crash course or very, very short crash course in church history. But I want to start by beginning at the end of the beginning. Uh, which is to ask you this question, what do you imagine when you think of the early church? So it could be anywhere between kind of, you know, the death of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus and the Constantinian settlement, which was around 312 AD. So anywhere in that 300 year window, whichever window you think is the most valid. Most Christians, when they talk about the early church, they're talking about the first 200 years or 150 years. So they're talking kind of 150 to 200 AD is the kind of, before that is the early church, and after it becomes the kind of more established church. But that key question of what do you imagine it actually looked like determines a great deal about how you approach the faith and how you approach the life of the church. Lots of people, when they make arguments about the, how the church should look, tend to fall back to the early church and say, well, in the early church it looked like this, and it probably did. Because the early church was by no means unanimous about anything. If you went to certain parts of the Anglican church, it was extremely Pentecostal and very Catholic and very um, and charismatic in a sense. But then you could go down a few streets from that or a couple of cities across, and, it's, and it has a, the roots of, the, of the, the Catholic church, of the practice of the Catholic church. You can go further away, and you've got roots of the Messianic Jewish movement. You can go further away than that, and you have roots of what are now the Assyrian and the Coptic traditions, which have slightly different theological takes on people like Mary and, 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 and how we understand Jesus' nature. The early church was by no means unanimous about anything. Uh, and so when we think about this question, we need to be careful because most people, when they make an argument about how the church should look, think that it's sort of monolithic. They, they will say something like, it had bishops everywhere and and it was the three orders of ordination, and it was all of these things, which is the Roman Catholic position. And there's degrees of truth to that. But equally, some will take it and say, well, in the early church, they, they, they still didn't eat certain foods, and they certainly practiced on certain days, and that's true in some places, but not at all through the whole of it. So as we think about the early church, we need to keep in mind the fact that it was incredibly divergent. There was no consistency, really, across the board other than the fact that they affirmed that Jesus was Lord. And exactly what that meant was still to be kind of completely worked out. They, they had not even sort of completely come to grips with the concept of the Trinity. So you had these incredibly divergent thoughts. So when we look back at that church as the kind of model or, or source of authority for how we think the church should be, we need to be aware that it wasn't monolithic but also aware of our own biases in that. Because almost all of us will have a position about how the church should look or how it should act or what it should think. And most of that will be rooted back in an argument to some sort of authority. Now, the, the church has agreed that scripture is something that we can argue authority from. But the early church is not something we agree we can argue authority from. We can look to it for learnings but they were just as muddled as us. <laughs> in fact, sometimes even more so. And so when we kind of fall back to the early church and say, well, in the early church we did this, it's not, a, it's not a really strong argument for how we should do it. And yet, most of our church practice, most of our understandings of how we should do things in the church are rooted back in arguments about that. So the reason the Presbyterian church is distinct from the Anglican church, fundamentally the interpretation of one word Episcopoi in the New Testament. It's used about five times, and the reason the Presbyterians had a different form of governance is because in some of the New Testament texts in the early church, there seemed to be that the local kind of pastor was the overseer of everything, and in other texts, it seems as though that overseer, which we in the Anglican church translate bishop, 
was over multiple churches, over multiple presbyters. And so there's all these little distinctions that develop into huge traditions because of an appeal to an authority that actually wasn't clear in the early church. And so when we come to some of those things over the next three weeks, we'll sort of dig into why there's that distinction and the difference in practice. But it's important that we have a think about this because it'll be framing the way we think about the church. But in the Presbyterian church, you do have moderators. Yes, yeah, but that's a word that was created about 500 years after that. <laughs> so, we're, again, when you're talking about Episcopoi in the New Testament, some, some of the texts sort of suggest that the Episcopoi was responsible for overseeing a number of different presbyters, which was sort of the word we would translate as pastor or priest. Yeah, yeah. But others carry a connotation that there's a distinction between a presbyter and an Episcopal, an overseer. And so the, the Anglican and Catholic Church would argue that there's three in the, in the New Testament. There's bishop, priest, and deacon, or presbyter and deacon. The Presbyterian Church argues that there's two. There's only a presbyter and a deacon in terms of the orders of the church. And so a moderator is typically one of those two things, but overseeing more than one. So it's, it's again, it's about a, a, a distinction of role and identity. So it, it's like saying... If there's only priests and deacons, then a priest can look after as many churches as they want, but they're still just a priest. But the Anglican Church looks at Paul's writing and says, well, no, there's a distinction between a priest or a presbyter and a bishop who oversees a region. So that's the distinction. That's the, that's the difference in governance that we'll come to in a couple of weeks. But um, this is an important thought process in terms of what's framing the ideas. Very condensed early church history or church history up until the modern times. We tend to talk about this framing of the early church and what that typically means is the, the death and resurrection of Jesus through until what we call the Constantinian settlement. So this was a period of history where the faith was expanding, uh, the apostles were teaching and then the generation after them, so the Timothys and others, took charge and, and developed and planted churches. This is the period in which most of the Mediterranean basin in one way or another, was converted to Christianity. A huge portion of the population was converted by scraps of texts and arguments by disciples. Uh, we tend to look back on it as a bit of a golden age of the church, and it, it was a really powerful evangelistic age. It was also very, very messy. Um, we didn't have any agreement on a whole lot of things, and yet very effective in the mission. What came after the early church is what's called the Constantinian settlement. Now, this is the result of Emperor Constantine, Roman Emperor at the time, converting to Christianity. Now, we could argue for weeks and months and years about whether he really became a Christian or whether he just saw the political benefit of being a Christian. It might have been a bit of both. Uh, but he got the control of, he got into this position, he became a Christian, and then slowly over time began to institute Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, the problem for a politician is what are you implementing? What does it mean to be Christian? What does it look like? Who's in charge of it? How do you structure this thing? What are the rules of the church? They suddenly became really, really important questions at the Constantinian settlement because they had to share this faith officially through the auspices of the state. And so that is what, at least initiated, it became the, the political background to what were some of the early church councils. So the most famous of which is the Council of Nicaea, which is heading towards 1,700 years old now. And Nicaea is the, is the council at which the, the Nicene Creed, which has become the kind of bedrock statement of Christian faith, was established. Now, again, we could argue a lot about this in the sense of how much emphasis or how much impact did Constantine have on that discussion. Historic record says very little. He basically said, sort yourselves out, pulled the bishops together and said, decide what it is that we believe. What does the church actually teach? What is, the, what is the apostles' faith? And actually drew out of the Apostles' Creed a little bit, but Constantine basically forced the church to say, this is what it means to be a Christian for the first time in about 300 years. People kind of knew before that. They did have the faith of the apostles that they affirmed at their baptism. They had teachers who were teaching very much what the Nicene Creed would go on to teach. But up until this point, there was no solid statement 
that everyone agreed to. There was an incredible amount of diversity. It's at this point that you start to get a little bit more of a monolithic church. Because all of a sudden, if you didn't completely adhere, you got crushed. So uh, the great examples of uh, churches within what, would, what is now sort of Asia Minor, so sort of Turkey and Greece, which in a lot of ways would have looked like the Pentecostal church today, absolutely crushed after Constantine took charge because they taught elements of, of spirituality that were kind of, well, we, we use the term Gnostic, not completely in keeping with what the creed had then come to articulate as the Christian understanding of the spirit and the body. So they sort of were still teaching that the body's a sort of a messy, dirty thing that the spirit has to escape. Prior to Constantine, that was kind of tolerated. It wasn't accepted, but no one really had authority to kick anyone else out. It was just a little bit more of a messy organization. But as Constantine sort of took charge, the bishops got a lot more power, the church itself got the power of the state, and it started to do a lot of uh, weeding out of people they didn't like. So there was a very long history here of exiles, return, corruption, and then sort of coming back, arguments, uh, disagreements that became statements of faith, and then they got knocked down by someone coming back. There was a lot of arguments in this period of history, uh, partly because the church is a human organization, and within that, certain people in power utilized the power that they now had to crush their enemies. Now, the, the one thing about the church in this period that can kind of be redeemed <laughs> is the fact that generally they let the arguments carry on. So typically because of the mandate not to kill, uh, they just got exiled. So in Athanasius is a great example, a hero of the faith, a man that was incredibly important in the Council of Nicaea. He was exiled about five times. And he came back every time because a certain bishop would die or someone would lose influence with the emperor. He'd come back in, cause a bit of a stir. He'd get accepted or rejected again and out again. But what tended to happen is these things would just boil away for about 100 or more years. And then they would do what's called a council. They'd pull together all of the bishops of the region and all the great teachers, all the people who were kind of part of the big argument, get them in a room and decide who's the heretic. <laughs> uh, to put it very sort of bluntly is what basically would happen. They'd make arguments from church history, they'd make arguments from scripture, they'd make arguments from sort of logic of understanding different ideas, and they would come to a statement where they'd go, this is, this is what the church officially teaches now. Um, um, from, from your teaching, just as you jump there, yep. what, what, what did define the early church? I mean, uh, I mean the yeah. difference between a focus on works as opposed to a human focus on power? No, there wasn't really, like, a lot of our definitions of what the church is now are so shaped by the Reformation that it was, it was really, there's no easy way to answer it because you can kind of have to come at a, a bit of a kaleidoscope. So from political perspective, like this is what philosophers would look back and say, is that, that Christianity was a, an understanding of God and, a, and an understanding of life that spoke to a people who had no power. So Nietzsche classically calls it a slave philosophy because it, it sort of feeds the idea of, you know, blessed are the poor. So in terms of the early church in the Roman world prior to Constantine, a big part of it was the fact that it actually gave people hope and, and, and utter despair from a sort of a philosophical side of it or a sociological side of it. Um, from, a, from a spiritual or Christian side of it or the, a religious side, the real emphasis was on the fact that Christ's name had power. So it's a little bit like when you go to Christianity in Africa now. Um, they're less concerned about the nuances of theology. Their concern is more that they have an understanding, particularly in Africa now, of, of sort of spiritual forces that oppress. And they find in their practice that Jesus frees them from. And so there's a degree to which part of it is just the fact it's effective. And so for a lot of the early church, at least in the, the poorer communities, the slave communities, a lot of it was about the fact that it was, Jesus just seemed to do something. Um, so it wasn't an intellectual exercise. It wasn't really, a, it wasn't really at, a, at a practice level uh, an understanding about how God was at work or it was more there's a liberation here um, in one way or another. 
When it got to sort of the, the slightly upper classes, the sort of more educated formed in the philosophy and, the, and that, that side of it, um, a lot of it was driven more by more, well, it depended again where you were. So the Romans more intrigued by antiquity and so it's sort of Jewish roots and it's sort of um, continuation and expansion into the non-Jewish world was what drew a lot of rich um, Romans into it. Um, but in terms of fundamentally, it's hard to answer without sounding Christian, basically. <laughs> so fundamentally, when you look at the early church, it stepped into a community where the, um, the Torah and the, the Jewish religion had been proclaimed and really quite a strong identity had been formed in lots of cities around what's called the diaspora, so where all the Jewish people mm -hmm. went to. And around those synagogues and communities, there were often very large communities of what were called God-bearers, which were people who were fascinated and even kind of worshipped the Jewish God, but hadn't made the step of circumcision and becoming fully Jewish. So the thing that really kicked the, the church off in the early days was this presence of these God-bearers. So every city they went to, there was a good hundred people minimum who were fascinated by the Jewish God, but didn't want to be circumcised. <laughs> so Paul would just show up to a synagogue, talk about it, and these guys would, would fall in love with it. So there's a degree to which it's the work of the Holy Spirit and, and forming people ready for receiving Jesus. Um, it's partly the, the, the efficacious nature of what their religious experience was. Um, they did have the kind of spiritual experiences that are kind of marked by the Pentecostal church now. So, you know, that experience of, of falling in the spirit of tongues and other things like that. Um, but it's, it's hard to name exactly what drove them to join and belong. Um, and then we don't really have good documentation of the church's thinking until later. And so it sort of had, you know, it was almost a fait accompli by that point in terms of what had been thought through and come to. So the closest thing we have is, um, well, there's the Didache, which is sort of a, a second century, so 100 AD-ish text, that is a bit of a collection of worship as well as a bit of reflection and sort of a book of homilies almost a reflection and most of it is about um, sort of Jesus's overcoming of death most of it is about his sort of efficacious power against spirits and a lot of it is about sort of that um, the emphasis on breaking down sort of religious and social barriers that so came within the, Jew within the Christian movement what, what I what I understand yeah. The focus is about people going and doing good things. Yeah, fundamentally. Um, it, yeah. Without actually emphasis on that. The whole thing about it, and, and sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But, is that he broke down barriers from just going straight to culture. And, and in fact, the, the idea of needing to have, and, 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 and in fact, said, I'm a God, my God, the, the need to have one or two or three people constructed as humans with a human. No, 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 no. That's that's not a fair interpretation. That's a very that's a very. Well, maybe that's that's me on this side of it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to define where I sit on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, because, because no one owns a, a complete sort of as you, you own words. No, no, uh, no one owns a complete understanding on anything. I mean, uh, certainly. I mean, there would have been, there were. So again, a lot of that language. So we tend to think of that, you know, let's say priests, bishops, and deacons, just because we know that in the Anglican Church. We tend to look at that and think hierarchy. Um, that is not at all how it really was in the early church, and it, not really what intended by it. It's simply the fact that in no matter how many, if you pull a group of people together, someone will be the pastor. Whether or not you name it, someone's going to be the pastor. And it's someone... It's human. Well, no, it is, but it's also a God-given thing. Well, that's if, the truth. Right? Well, the, how do you... Because you, you've got to... Okay, explain your anthropology then. Where does this come I, I, I from? Understand human? Human, I understand human anthropology. And yeah. We do tend to have leaders and we do tend to do that. That's human, that's ego. The, 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 to me. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's, that's, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's ego. But the, the message is a direct message to God for everybody. Sure. Yeah. M maybe yeah. somebody is required to actually, in fact, articulate that message. But I don't need you today, not focusing on you, yeah, yeah, yeah. or Bishop Andrew to give me a connection. 
No, 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 not at all. No, the Holy Spirit is definitely levels that completely. Um, I, the thing is that you absolutely have a, so the, the Christian understanding, and we sort of we'll go off topic a little bit and come back. The Christian understanding is absolutely, you can have a personal relationship with God, and you are absolutely, but you can't do that without a community. And if you're I in a community, right. you there is think, discipline, you think to it. That's and there is, so. there is a natural structure that follows from that. But I think when I'm talking about the anthropology yeah. side of it, a Christian understanding would say that most of those dynamics of human nature, the fact that some are called to be leaders and some are called to other positions within that, is a God-given thing. Whereas ego carries, I mean, it doesn't always, but it tends to carry within our culture a negative connotation, which is that some people feel like they have to be in charge. No, you can have a bad ego and a good ego. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. The, the word ego, and I'm using it, yeah. is the human concept as opposed to the divine concept. Yeah, the divine um, concept for me is the is the vertical, and the ego is the horizontal, which I find myself in every day of the week. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean, it's if you if you so the way in my understand it is if you project this into the future and let's say you know everyone's gone to heaven, you know it's all perfect. There is no pastor in heaven. I, I'm the only person in terms of the understanding of human behaviour in life. My job is the only one that disappears after the resurrection because you don't need me anymore, because you don't need a specific person to engage with the text because God's right there. So the, the dynamic is, yeah, in a sense, you're, you're correct in a bit. The, the role of the church's leadership is an interim thing. It's not a permanent dynamic, which means it is ultimately kind of a fallen human thing. So in that sense, yes, it is a, it is a human thing, but I'd say it's also a God-ordained thing to help shape community. Because the problem is if you have each of us, you know, with our relationship with God, you're never subject to anybody. And so you never get reshaped. You're never forced to reconsider. You're never, you, you can be if you're the right sort of person, but most people wouldn't. <laughs> and so the rough edges of our faith, as well as our fundamental Christian dynamic, which is again, what drove the early church? Fundamentally this point. We want to grow into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. And without the, the kind of subjection or submission that has to come with church community, you just can't. Because ultimately you'll just make your statement and be done with it. So that there's a dynamic to which that belonging component is a really important component of reshaping who we are into a more full likeness of Christ. Now, yeah. In saying that, that's an idealised form of church community because most of them <laughs> will get you closer, but often by what you call negative formation. Like they'll teach you what you don't want to be. But in the, the essence of the church's existence in scripture is partly to help to shape Christians by the force of clash. Well, humans, humans, and humans will always fail because they're human. But the scripture, the, the scripture and the model is there. You know, and, and you don't need a failed minister not you, <laughs> to, to yeah. actually interact, uh, interact with you. No. Well, not, 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 anyway. not, not I, fundamentally. I, I, I think I, it's. I, I, I just, I had thought the early church defined itself more, I mean, there was all this going on, <coughs> by people actually being good people in community and yeah. actually, and yeah, actually it, it going does. out but and not saying you're a leper, no. you're a. <laughs> You're a tax collector. Yeah, but You're the, actually part of me. Yes, it is. But I think it's, it would be very easy if you allowed that to perpetuate itself to get to a point where actually the theology and the definition of who Jesus is and the definition of who God is in Jesus Christ doesn't matter. I think it matters. It does, absolutely. I mean, that's, the, that's the, it's the, really what we're doing with language there in terms of if it's mostly about doing what Jesus says, which it is, and it was, certainly in the Greco-Roman world, that's what the church did to, to win the world, it, it, it was all driven by a deep revelation of who God is in yeah. Jesus Christ. So, that, so that's the... doing my work, I'm doing God's work. Yeah, absolutely. I, get, I, I, yeah, yeah. I absolutely get that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm just interested to, to really have an understanding of what the early church looked like. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the problem. It's, 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 it's probably more Catholic than you think, in terms of its practice, but it's also much more uh, practically geared than most churches are, at least most church leaders are um, today. It is very much a how do I welcome the leper into my home kind of faith. Mm. Uh, certainly in the, it was different in different places, but Greco-Roman world, absolutely.
Because it can, it still comes back though, doesn't it? To our relationship with the yes. Lord. We can do it in our own flesh. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah. That's the worldly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So we, we need to be careful not to get some of the Reformation language as well into that language of the flesh and the sinful. So <laughs> flesh in the New Testament, sinful desire, which is sort of, I mean, that could be the negative connotation of ego there. Yeah, but it, it's yeah. also, when we talk about that in the church now, we tend to be shaping it by works of justification and, and yeah. righteousness, which is not really what, it is sort of what the church is going to do, but the Reformation heightened that a bit. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. <laughs> Um, so, ecumenical councils, this, this sort of ongoing battle of what we actually believe and what, what is, fundamentally the question is, who is the God that we actually worship? Because as you define more and more an understanding of who Jesus is, you come to understand who God is more and more. What that inevitably did was create moments and situations where some people felt like they could no longer be in communion. So over time, that, that developed into some different branches of the faith. So if you go into the Middle East, there's sort of Ethiopian church, there's Coptic church, which is actually schismed around 800-ish AD, uh, very early on, most of it around Mary. Um, they were not keen on Mary. And then the other part of it was the Nesotorians, which argued that Jesus was one person with two natures. A little bit complicated, <laughs> but... Let's just suffice it to say we've come to the conclusion that you know that Jesus is a whole person, uh, not a double person. But um, these schisms sort of developed around little nuances of understanding. The biggest ones came in the Eastern churches splitting off. So what became known as the Orthodox Church. So the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox. So Constantinople, which is Istanbul, they had a patriarch. And the big difference here was Rome was growing in power and its prestige and it was starting to throw its weight around a little bit. And this was really the beginning of the arguments about who's the boss boss. So this, this is where bad ego kind of came in. Um, and so the, the, constant, sorry, the Constantinople patriarch who became the patriarch of the Orthodox Church couldn't accept the idea of the Pope as the sort of the supreme bishop, the, the boss bishop, the, the part, last point of call for all arguments. They saw themselves as an equal measure there were five patriarchs in the early church, and they saw themselves as balanced, but Rome, as it grew in power, sort of started to stand for claim, basically. Um, big, a big component of that was really back to who got to appoint the leaders. And a large part of that, it sort of had two dimensions. It had part of it was just negative ego stuff about who's the boss. But the other side of it was the recognition that actually who appointed the bishops, then appointed the priests, you determined the theology and the understanding of each of those church communities quite heavily. So it was an incredibly significant power to have. Um, so a lot of those arguments, some of them came from a very good place, some of them came from a very bad place, but they started a bunch of schisms, basically. The... These schisms all related to this one as well, which became the marker of the Western Church. So when the Orthodox Church split off, you really had Western Europe, so sort of Germany over to the UK, or what's now the UK, is known as the Western Church. And they had this contention between papal authority and imperial authority. So that was um, whether it was the Pope or the King that was in charge, and what were they in charge of? So in most of the Western world, it ended up being that the emperor was in charge of the secular world, the temporal, the, the wars and the money and that sort of stuff. The Pope was in charge of the, the spiritual realm. But the real test of it came when it came to who, who kind of commissioned the emperor. So does the Pope have to approve who becomes the emperor? And that became the real point of conflict. So the Holy Roman Empire started this negotiation and this argument and sort of toed and froed a lot. The West, rest of the Western world never really fell fully under this way because the Pope ultimately had very limited authority outside of the Roman papal state area of Italy. Um, and so a lot, of this, a lot of this in the wider Western world was lip service. The main power that the Pope had at that time was excommunication. So if you said something bad or if you did something negative against the Pope, you could be excommunicated. Um, and that would mean a whole lot of things. Partly it meant that you might have someone try and overthrow your country because it was sort of a statement that you're fair game to invade. Uh, but the other side of it was that your children 
may not be able to inherit your throne. So if you're excommunicated, your kids can't take over the throne afterwards. So there was a lot of these backwards and forwards about who was really in charge and, and who was the boss of the bosses. Um, this was all purely ego, <laughs> purely negative ego. Um, mostly, again, having distracted from church seeking to be the hands and feet of Jesus through to church as institution and power broker. Um, and, it, and it really began the downward slide that led the church to what would ultimately be called the Reformation and the challenges that came with that. Now, we're talking about Anglicanism, and that's, uh, so Anglican, to give you a sense of what that means, it literally comes from the title Ecclesia Anglicana, which just means the Church of the English. So Anglican just means the Angle Church, the Angles Church. Um, so it's the, the church of everyone that speaks the Angle language, which became Anglo-Saxon and became English. In terms of the English Isles and their religious expression or their Christian expression, it started with Imperial Rome, went to Anglo-Saxons, then it became Roman Catholic. So traders, slaves, merchants bring, bring, brought the faith, I should say, to uh, the people of Ireland, uh, to the people of the British Isles, uh, predominantly Celtic people, but also obviously the Roman people who were occupying the area as well. They go by a lot of different names. Britain is one of them, but Celts is pretty accurate as well. Christianity survived Rome's exit, but only just. Um, so as the Anglo-Saxons came and invaded, so the Angles and the Saxons from Germany came over, took over, basically wiped out the Celts, they brought with them paganism. So they brought back a lot of the sort of the northern European pagan beliefs, and Christianity really began a, a quite a steep decline after the Roman Empire evacuated the, the islands. Slowly, it re-established itself, and in 587, St. Augustine was appointed as the first Archbishop of Canterbury, and under him, they basically undertook a massive campaign of evangelism. Uh, so the, this is where some of those classic saints arrived, St. Patrick, Lindisfarne, Alban, Cuthbert, uh, amongst so many others, who were often monastic leaders, so led abbeys or, or monastic orders, and they would send their monks out for various periods of time to go and evangelise a village, uh, establish a new monastery, and then slowly kind of convert the people to Christianity. And that kind of just spread through the entire British Isles slowly. Uh, they were incredibly effective, mostly by their blood. Uh, so Alban was one of the first, was the first British martyr. Um, so his cathedral is still in uh, North London. And by and large in the early church, martyrdom absolutely drove conversion. Um, there's a saying in the early church, or at least even in this part of the church's life, that the, the growth of the church is watered by the blood of the martyrs, basically. It became points where the seriousness with which their faith was exercised and the witness that came with it just won people over in a massive way, or at least opened their imagination to this possibly being true. By this point, they had become what would be known as Roman Catholic. Um, this was by the time this point that, you know, the doctrines around the Eucharist hadn't been developed, but certainly the practices of what's now known as the Mass would have been initiated by this point in history. It would have looked fairly Roman Catholic when the monastic orders had come through. The, the, they appointed what were called secular priests, which were priests that weren't part of the religious order, and they would have looked very much like, um, you know, the, the church just prior to the Reformation in terms of their day-to-day -day practice. Oh, sorry, did these people come from Ireland, or was this? Uh, uh, Lindisfarne and um, Cuthbert were kind of in and around that part of the world. Um, Patrick mostly stayed in Ireland. Uh, Alban was sort of more southern a wee bit, but it's, um, most of them were rooted back to monastic orders like Iona and Lindisfarne and others oh. like that. Um, they they were really they were basically monks. Monks. Um, yeah, they were absolutely is how the how the Western. Um, hemisphere was converted really with monks. <laughs> um, so that was sort of the beginnings of the, the real re-establishment of the church. And then we came into we became the Normans. So 1066, um, William the Conqueror comes through, brings with him a bunch of French people, uh, actually more specifically Normans. Now Normans were people, were actually Vikings, who the King of France basically paid off with land. Said, stop raiding us, we'll give you this part of the thing that came called Normandy. Uh, so these guys they were incredibly separatist in their attitude of the church. They hated Rome. They really loathed Roman influence. They put up with it because they realized there wasn't really a lot of option at the time. 
but there was a very distinct sort of form of church life slowly develop. A lot of the bishops and a lot of the others kind of did what they did at home, but when Rome arrived, they kind of went, let's do it properly now. <laughs> Um, this is when distinctly English practices and rites started to develop. So uh, one of the things that you won't hear much, but one of the defining features of the Anglican Church that gives it validity in terms of the Roman Catholic world is a thing called the Sarum Rite, and it was established at Old Sarum, and it was a form of the Eucharist that became quite normative for a lot of Western Europe. So that moment, as that was, it was sort of developed, the English church got a name for itself within the Roman Catholic world as a place that actually kind of knew what it was doing theologically, liturgically, and in terms of worship. So when people talk, when the, the Roman Catholics talk about the Anglican orders coming back into the, the Roman Catholic church, they often will talk about use of the Sarum Rite as the kind of way of doing it. it it's a little bit technical and liturgical, but um, it's an expression of an early form of um, Eucharist that was developed particularly in the English context. As you kind of move from the Normans through to the Reformation, which is quite a few hundred years there, so there's a lot of history to go down, um, you develop really the, the, the elements of this start to come out the other end. And it's one of the things that marks the English Reformation, and it's uh, similar to the German Reformation. They were what's called magisterial reformations, which really meant that the question wasn't exactly what we believe, it was about who's actually in charge. So is the Pope the head of the church, was fundamentally the questions behind a lot of the, um, the magisterial reformation. And mostly it just meant that the king, the princes, and the, 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 the authorities of the empire or the state were deeply enmeshed in the conversation about reformation for the magisterial reformers. For the other reformations, so like the Anabaptists, um, the Calvinists, and others, the state wasn't even a consideration. It was, let's get the church right, and then we'll work out the church-state relationship. The, the English, the German, they were deeply entangled. You, you couldn't pull them apart. They, they were seen as the same thing. Now, you can have lots of arguments about that because, in a sense, again, God, and certainly in the, in the scriptures, the, the civic authorities are, at least in word, ordained by God. And so the ones that you have are the ones you've got. And so there's a degree to which they will be inevitably enmeshed in the church. How much they should be, that's an argument for discussion. And whether these guys were right in their kind of magisterial reformation is another question. When I say that, I shouldn't say that at no point did any of those magisterial reformers believe that the king was in charge of the church. So when we talk about the king or the queen being the head of the Anglican church, does not mean that they are in charge by any means, and it certainly doesn't mean they've replaced Jesus. It simply means that when it comes to the question of who has the authority to appoint bishops, who has the authority to determine you know, how money should be spent, those questions, they stem back to the king, or at least in the Church of England it does. It doesn't in the New Zealand Anglican Church, but in the Church of England it does. So it really became a question of temporal power, so that the matters of this world, who got to determine it? In terms of the, all of those churches still affirm that Jesus is the head of the church. It's just the, the governor of the church in a sense. In the same way that a parish is a vestry which runs its temporal things, and then you have the ministry team <coughs> that run its spiritual things. So that's a very brief history of the English Reformation. The distinctives of it. The magisterial, the state was the same as a part of it. How did the king, the bishop, and the priest relate were fundamentally the questions that the English reformers were trying to determine. How did this play a part? So the Pope was claiming that the king has no say in the church. The king was saying the Pope shouldn't have any say in the church because it's the national church, it's the church of the English. And the bishops were kind of caught in the middle of it going, well, what do we do with this? Uh, that was a fundamental question for the English reformers. It was ecclesiological rather than theological for the English church. Now that is a big distinction from most of the, the continental reformation. Most of the continent was concerned primarily about how to get a better definition of salvation by grace alone, or how should the church worship and, and result to those things. The English church was less concerned about articulating that better so much as it was about reforming away the stuff within the Roman Catholic church that started to go against that teaching. 
So it started it removed things like the, the payment for indulgences, so being able to pay your way out of purgatory. It got rid of uh, what was called simony, which is the idea that the, a priest could hold multiple offices and get paid multiple times. It, it took away some of the elements around liturgical rites that suggested that your actions redeemed you, um, as opposed to salvation by grace. Um, in the continent, the whole push was teaching, practice, worship, church, all have to be reshaped by that idea that grace is what saves us. The English church sort of said, let's remove the stuff that suggests grace isn't what saves us, which means that it wasn't such a, a full force removal of everything. The English church basically said, tradition is awesome as long as it's not contrary to scripture, which is why we do lots of stuff that doesn't completely make sense. Because <laughs> a lot of the traditions just developed over hundreds and hundreds of years in the church's practice. And the Anglican attitude what to basically is to say, if it's not, if scripture doesn't oppose it, it's okay. Whereas most other continental reformers say, unless scripture approves it, it's not okay. Especially when it comes to church. And that subtle distinction makes for a very different church. So within the sort of Baptist and the more Reformed side, it tends to be, unless Scripture particularly says this is how you are to do it, just don't do it. Whereas the Anglican Church sort of says, look, it's, it's pretty much anything's okay as long as Scripture does not say you cannot do it. So it, it has produced a very different attitude, and it, it's one of the markers of it, which is that the Anglican Church honours tradition quite highly. So we've traditionally sort of talked to ourselves about Scripture, tradition, and reason are kind of the, the Anglican tri triennial of interpretation. So scripture is the top thing, it's the core authority, but tradition, in terms of how the church has historically understood things, matters to an Anglican. It doesn't necessarily matter to a Protestant by and large. They would say that unless it says scripture, unless that says that there's no kind of authority to teach it, whereas the Anglican church would say, if the church has held it for a very long time, and it doesn't contravene scripture, there's no reason to kick it out, basically. So is that a more liberal way of... Well, it depends on what you mean by liberal. I mean, it's certainly not like, in terms of our current definition of liberal, it's not. In fact, it's actually arch-conservative. It's extraordinarily conservative. It sort of says that, basically, what we do is done for a good reason. We may not understand why, but it's done for a good reason, so let's not throw it out unless something contradicts it. In fact, I mean, by our current definitions, Calvinism and other, they were extremely liberal in terms of our understanding of tradition and its history. So conservatism is typically defined by a, a, an adherence to something older, right? You're holding on to something. So Anglicanism in that sense is actually deeply, deeply conservative. It holds on to things unless it's proven by bad. Whereas the, the, the Protestant church is quite liberal in its thinking. It's Nothing really matters unless I can prove it by scripture. So it, again, it's about how you're defining those terms. Not liberal theologically in terms of throwing out Jesus or anything like that, but liberal in its social attitude. Um, so that, that's sort of a, a part of it. Um, and the key question here was who appointed bishop? And how was orthodoxy maintained? So how do you keep the faith of the church without losing an understanding of how are we going to do that? That was a key question of the early church. For lots of Protestant Reformation, it was about catechisms. It was about, here's a list of 150 million questions that you need to know the answer to, and then you're good to go. Here's a doctrine statement of belief. The Anglicans didn't go that path, which we're going to talk about in a moment. The other bit is unity and uniformity. How does a nation of Catholics and Protestants live and worship together? There was a very realist sort of politic about the English Reformation. They went, we're not going to get rid of all the Catholics. And the Catholics went, we're not going to get rid of all the Protestants. They said, how do we get these guys, these guys in their villages and their towns and their cities, how do we all worship together without killing each other? Is fundamentally a question that the English Reformation tried to answer. How can we accept one another? Where can we find common ground to be able to worship together in a uniform way? So those are the key questions. But behind all of those were a large number of political dynamics, <laughs> to say the least. During the period of Reformation, there were four 
royal figures that were really important. The first of which was Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII, for all his sins and badnesses, um, he absolutely, he kicked the Pope out because he wanted to get divorced. That is absolutely why he did it. But that is not what motivated the English reformers. So at this time in history, the English reformers were active and trying to get the church reformed. What you will find at this point in time is that the reformers took the opportunity and basically said, we can help you. <laughs> Just get rid of the Pope and we're good to go. So it was a bit of a marriage of convenience in some respects. Henry VIII rejected the Pope as an authority, but everything else remained the same. Worship went into English, but the, the essence of the language, the essence of the practice, the, the doctrine, the theology, everything was exactly as it was prior to the Reformation for Henry VIII. Just the Pope disappeared, and the language went to English rather than Latin. So it was a very minimal Reformation. After Henry was Edward VI. Edward was a continentally educated man. He was much more Calvinistic. He was uh, educated in France by Protestants, um, and so he came into that position and that role with a far greater sense of a reformed and Protestant attitude to things. This is when the first prayer book was ever published. It got burned, but <laughs> the first English prayer book was published under Edward VI, and it was very reformed in its theology. Um, it, was, it was the beginnings of really the really strong Protestants <coughs> and what would later be called the Puritan movement within the Church of England. He, he was a reflection of the more Protestant wing of the church. Then he died young uh, and was replaced by Mary I, otherwise known as Bloody Mary, um, who was deeply Roman Catholic, married to a, a Spanish king who was also deeply Roman Catholic, uh, re-engaged the Pope, basically re-established the uh, Roman Catholic Church in the English in the British Isles, and went on an absolutely murderous rampage against all of the Protestant bishops and leaders who had been a part of Edward's reign. This was a period where, when this happened, most of the English state couldn't care less which way it had gone. They, just, they basically were saying, just give us our religion. <laughs> Tell me what to do and it's all good. Um, after this, the English people had become extremely Protestant, far more so because of uh, particularly the martyrdom of a few figures, like Latimer and others, who were burned at the stake um, and made such a strong statement in their martyrdom that a lot of the English people just went, what is this? This is, and particularly it started to touch on a bit of a nerve of nationalism and isolationism, but it, it, it was a statement of their martyrdom really that tipped in favor towards the Protestant church and became uh, it made Mary's role and place as queen nearly impossible to defeat. She, so her classic label, Bloody Mary, is quite accurate, and it was a big reason why she struggled. After her was Elizabeth I. Um, Elizabeth served for a very long time, which is really the reason that she was effective in this respect. Um, she served nearly 50 years. She was absolutely Protestant in her devotion and her theology. So she was very much formed again by the continental reformers, by Luther and by Calvin. But she was willing to compromise for unity. So she'd seen all of this and went, this probably isn't worth it, so let's find a compromise. And that that's becomes what's called the Elizabethan religious settlement. So in her first years of her reign, she established a few pieces of information or a few acts, the key one being the Act of Supremacy, which placed the Queen as the head or the, the, the governor of the Church of England and eradicated the Pope. And it, it forced everyone in the Church of England to kind of recognise her in that role. The second is the Act of Uniformity, which was to say that you will worship in the Church of England and you will only worship in the Church of England. If you do not, you will be killed. Um, it was a very strong statement, but it was um, the beginnings of you can't go to the private Roman mass, you have to go to our one church, our one worship, our one offering, primarily because it needed to be uniform. If we were to live together, we have to worship together, is basically Elizabeth's attitude in this. There were a number of royal injunctions. This, this mostly set up how things were to be led and how things to be offered. Uh, she also established what was called the Book of Common Prayer, which really wasn't replaced until the 1900s. 
Um, it, it is the 1662 version of the Book of Common Prayer lasted until 1928 when it was reviewed, um, which is how foundational doctor, that document is to the Anglican Church. And she approved what were known as the 39 Articles, which is what we'll come to in a few weeks as we talk about Anglican doctrine. Um, for those who don't believe the Anglican Church has a doctrine, it definitely does. It's located in those articles. So this winding story is kind of what shaped the, the Church of England's response to the Reformation. They, they, unlike the German Church, which kind of, you could be really negative here and say, they kind of enjoyed the battle a little bit, um, and they kind of wanted to get to a state of purity. So there was a, a lot of bloodshed and a lot of violence and a lot of division. Is that the Lutheran? Uh, Lutheran, Calvin, a lot of the, the Zwingli, all of them kind of came. Uh, Switzerland, France, and Germany were pretty Much. mixed together at that point. And because Germany particularly didn't really have a political structure that was bigger, it was pretty messy. So each prince had their own thing and they just went to war constantly. Um, a big part of the, the world that we know, the post-Enlightenment world, is in part because of those bought wars. The amount of blood that was shed over this is quite staggering. Elizabeth realised, actually, if we're going to keep a nation, we have to find a compromise in this. And so the Book of Common Prayer was the compromise. It was the way of answering that question. The fundamental question. If the English Reformation had a question, it would be, how do we worship together? Not how we're going to define our salvation theology, not how are we going to define our ecclesiology, not do bishops have the right or do these people have a right. We just kind of went, let's just leave all those questions. <laughs> if we're going to get this to work as a nation, we have to work out how we worship together. Now, this really isn't a question we would ask today. It's a question that was asked then because the, the nation was considered a unitary thing. It was, there was, there were subjects of the queen, basically. That's how it was seen politically. We now would see ourselves as citizens of a nation. We can have difference of opinions and difference of attitudes and we can be a bit different. At the time, that wasn't really seen. So to be English meant to be part of the English church. And so it's a frame of politics and religion that we really had moved beyond, but that was their question. How do we do this together? And so they established a, a thing here, which was called the Book of Common Prayer. And uh, it goes to the point where I'd say that Anglican devotion, which really means Anglican worship, is our ecclesiology. How we worship is how we understand the church. And fundamentally, the, the driving force behind it <coughs> is the idea that we need to be able to bring as many people together as possible while also maintaining accurate belief or a proper belief. And the result of that is, is, is again, the Book of Common Prayer that we'll come to in a moment. But how Anglicans worship is an expression of how they understand the church and what they believe. The prayer book became the means by which Anglicans affirmed identity and fellowship, not doctrine, and not the pontiff, not the pope. So for a lot of other churches, it's about their affirmation of faith. So if you go to a, a Presbyterian or a Reformed person, the Westminster Catechism, if you can say the Westminster Catechism, you're a Presbyterian or you're, <laughs> you're Reformed. Uh, if you can say, you know, uh, some of the other creeds of the, the Lutheran and other churches, you, you're a Lutheran. For Anglicans, it's actually about, if you worship according to the Book of Common Prayer, you're an Anglican. It's not about the, the particular doctrines that you personally hold behind it. It's about how you worship and who you worship with and, and the style that you do that. So the devotion became the, the mark of identity and belonging, um, which is quite a distinction from everywhere else. The Book of Common Prayer gave a shared expression that allowed for diversity of doctrine and understanding. By limiting the freedom to very worship and wording, so you could not touch the wording of the Book of Common Prayer. You still can't now. Like I, I'm not allowed to change the words of the liturgy. Uh, certainly not the Great Thanksgiving. Because in those words is our doctrine. So if I fiddle with it because I don't like a certain word, I'm actually breaching basic Anglican ecclesiology. It is where we hide our doctrine. If you, we don't have a catechism, well, we do, but it's rubbish. Our, our belief is locked up in our liturgy. And that's why we say it over and over and over again, is to instill it into your head. So limit the choice of freedom to very worship and wording. The church maintains an orthodoxy and expression and formation. What that means is that you 
you have a uniform sort of style of worship, but you're also forming people in the same sort of way. They're hearing the same words, they're hearing the same explanation of what Jesus did, they're hearing the same words of scripture, they're engaging with this formational practice that deepens their understanding, while also potentially holding belief that is kind of contrary to it. This is the dynamic, I find this fascinating in the Anglican Church. I remember sitting in a church service in Auckland, and the priest, for about 15 minutes, just talked about how our understanding of the atonement isn't really good, and that actually there's no atonement in the New Testament, and all of those sort of things, which is deeply heretical in terms of the te church's teaching. But he then went up and prayed the 404 Great Thanksgiving, and it says in there that, you know, Jesus is the one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world, kind of thing. So Anglicanism, it, it covers itself with this doctrine that is hidden away in our liturgy and our worship that is our correct teaching. Sometimes the priests aren't right. Sometimes the, the congregation's not right. Sometimes we're all wrong. But the liturgy, as we understand it, captures the essence of what we really believe and that really shapes us. In a sense, what that forces us to do is if you're going to say the atonement doesn't exist, how do you explain the great thanksgiving? You have to reinterpret it. You, you might not be able to reinterpret it, but you have to deal with it because it's right there in the text. So that's kind of the Anglican approach. We're going to have this service of worship that names it. If you disagree with it, tell us why, <laughs> is the essence of it. Uh, and then finally, this is kind of our, our ecclesiological statement. The people who pray together stay together. Um, belonging is rooted in devotional conformity rather than doctrinal conformity. So the thing that keeps Anglicans together is not that we all believe the same thing, it's that we kind of all worship in a very similar way. It's that actually we agree that there's sort of a structure and a way in which we're going to worship and a set of words that we're going to use that kind of give us an identity that is distinct, as opposed to we are you know, the people who believe this particular doctrine or we believe that particular idea, we worship this way, therefore we're Anglicans. In fact, over these things, we all disagree about most of it. But we do this all together. So that's kind of the essence of it. There are two things that are assumed in that. One is that worship is ultimately, in some respect, an act of formation. So we tend to look at worship as something that we offer, that we, we bring to God, and it is something we bring, we, we offer it. But the Anglican Church would argue that actually in the act of worshipping, you are forming who you are. You are forming an understanding of the world, about an understanding of God, an understanding of how things work. So you're engaging with the words of liturgy, which are predominantly scripture. You're engaging with the imagery, the themes, the practices, and that is having an impact on you, whether or not you recognise it. It is reshaping how you think about the world. The other side of it is the idea, and it's kind of tied to it, liturgy is a rehearsal of Christian life. Now, this is sort of a little bit more nuanced, but when, the, when Thomas Cranmer established the Book of Common Prayer, particularly the structure of the Eucharist, he was doing it in a near antithesis to the Roman Mass. He was establishing it as a statement that constantly reaffirmed that you were here by grace alone. So it begins with a, a pleading to God for, through the Lord's Prayer, those words that Jesus has given us. It then moves into a confession and absolution. It's a recognition that actually in our own power we have no right to stand here. That it's only by God's grace that we receive that. Then we move through that, that engagement. So hearts cleared, recognize our place before God. We're open to receive the word. We receive the word. Then we carry through a sermon. We kind of expound upon it. We develop it. We offer our prayer in response. We acknowledge one another as brothers and sisters in the peace, this peace that comes through the revelation of it, and then we share at the table of the Lord. It, it is a very particular, particularly developed model of practice that is supposed to teach us essentially what it looks like to be Christian or what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. It's a recognition of the humility of our position the, the grace that we've received in, in receiving Jesus Christ, but also the welcome and the embrace of God that's in the table. And the, the particular, the Book of Common Prayer is much more reformed in its practice of this. Um, if you've ever read the Book of Common Prayer, you cannot leave that service without being very aware that you're a sinful person, and you cannot leave without being aware of God's grace. The New Zealand Prayer Book, 
fluff, fluffs it up a little bit, so you can kind of miss some of that. But in terms of its core practices, it's about the formation of your spirit and your mind as you undertake the act of worship. So there's a very particular, that's part of the reason why liturgy is so careful and why we've been so conservative about it, because it is a fundamental kind of formational tool of the church in the Anglican understanding. Whereas in most denominations and most practices, it's often just an expression. It's a, it's a thing you bring, not a thing that shapes you. Well, it does shape you, but they don't talk about it that way. Um, very briefly, you probably need to talk about the fact that it's not always looked like this. Um, it's always been liturgical. It's always been relatively structured, and it's always been led by bishops, priests, or deacons. But in terms of its nature, it has swung massively through time. Uh, in, the, in the church around Elizabeth, it would have looked far more reformed. It would have looked downright Presbyterian. <laughs> sort of 1950s Presbyterian is what it would have looked like at Elizabeth's time. No colours, very little robes, very few candles, very simple tables, very simple churches. Uh, under a few kings after that, you've got what was called Lordianism, which is sort of what was now we'd call Anglo-Catholicism, which is bringing back a bit of the pomp and the ceremony and the colour and the drama. That caused a civil war. <laughs> so for about, really, about 300, 400 years, the Anglican Church looked pretty much like what the Presbyterian Church did at the turn of the century. It had a quarterly Eucharist. Most of the services were word services, not Eucharistic, not sacramental. Uh, often the other sacraments beyond confirmation and ordination weren't really practiced. Um, and its theology was much more uh, in line with the Presbyterian teaching at the time. Then we came into a movement in the mid-1800s, which was known as the, the Tractarian Movement or the Oxford Movement. And this was a group of young clergy, really, who, who sort of emphasised the Catholic heritage of the Anglican Church as a source of its validity. And so suddenly, all of the old stuff sort of came back. Now, probably what you'd find is that it's probably enough time since the violence of the Reformation for them to be able to bring that back without it causing a deep consternation within the, <laughs> within the national spirit. But suddenly came back things like colours, uh, verses and veils, weekly, if not daily, communion, uh, elves and stoles. All of that was not used by the church for a good 400 years. Um, bishops' mitres were not used by the bishops until the eight, late 1800s. Uh, bishops, prior to the Oxford movement, were basically glorified administrators. Like, <laughs> they weren't really acknowledged in the way they are now. Um, a lot of what we look at in Anglican worship as kind of, that's just what we've always done, it really only came back into the Anglican Church in the mid-1800s. Uh, prior to that, it really was quite reformed in its appearance and practice. Um, so it, it, it's sort of drawn back. Now, there's a whole lot of arguments why. Uh, we're going to tackle them a little bit next week as we talk about polity or the politics of the Anglican Church, but fundamentally it came back to this question of where does the authority of the church come from? And so within the Catholic movement, or the Catholic understanding, there's a rootedness to bishops, and particularly bishops in what's called the apostolic succession which is the idea that the Anglican Church teaches this, which is that Bishop Andrew can, if he wishes to, trace his ordination all the way back to the apostles. <laughs> so there's a continuity of church leaders ordained from Jesus through Paul, you know, from Peter and others, all the way to the contemporary bishop. That, that's known as the apostolic succession. And it defines what can make a bishop, essentially, in the church's understanding. Lots of reasons why, and we'll talk about them next week because it sounds very odd. Um, but for the Catholic side of the church, the thing that defines authority is the fact that you can trace the teaching and the root and the person and the ordination back to the apostles. For the Protestant side, it's that your teaching and your practice looks like the early church and the apostles. So you're teaching the same thing as the apostles and you're kind of practicing the same faith as the apostles. For the Roman Catholic side, it's about having a bishop that is in succession back. And there's a few polity questions in there that we'll tackle next week as we look at it. Anglican devotion through the ages, it's gone from reform to Roman, fluctuates greatly even within cities. 
But this is kind of a key point. All of the expressions of our, of our church assume Christendom, which is the real flaw of the Anglican model. It assumes a nation of Christians. So as I talked about, our, our key question of the Reformation, how do we worship together? How do we, as a bunch of Christians who have different opinions, how do we worship together? That is the key Anglican ecclesiological question. The battle is when you don't have a nation full of Christians, and you have a, a missional mindset, and a, and a mindset of, you know, there needs to be evangelism and the engagement of the gospel again, does that sort of attitude fit? Is that what the church needs to be uh, in the contemporary age? I will argue that it does, but we can kind of come to that. Um, but essentially, all of our worship is basically, of all of our practice, the devotion and even Anglican reformed policy and politics and understanding Assume we're dealing with a group of people who are Christians, and the question is about how do we do church. It doesn't take into account the idea that the people we're talking to might not be Christian. And it doesn't take into account the idea that they may not actually have any opinion about how the church should be. It is a model of church that is designed for a Christian nation, not for a mission community. And that is a real, that's where a lot of the, the challenges of the Anglican system come in. And so there is a real striving in their own way now to find a different way or a third way between this Reformed and Catholic. Now the beauty is anytime you go for a third way, it tends to elevate and escalate the other two as well. So whenever a, a different form of politics arrives, what you tend to get is extreme you know, aggravation on either two sides of that as well. So you get... Lots of really conservative people, you get lots of really liberal people <coughs> when a centrist movement begins. In the same respect, you get lots of centrist people and liberal people when a conservative movement begins. And those sorts of things happen. Anglicanism is facing the same thing. We really don't know what we're going to do because we're a church in crisis in a lot of ways as a denomination, outside, at least in the Western world we are. And within that, you get two big responses. You get a liberal response that says, well, we need to rethink everything. And you get a conservative side that says we can't question anything. And in that, you tend to find that actually this other model comes into play, which is that there's actually a path between them. Now, that is a good little segue to, to hint into you also a kind of com component of Anglican teaching that is going to be important for next week and the week after, which is a term called via media, which is the Anglican attitude towards everything, the middle way. Uh, we're not reformed, we're not Catholic, we're reformed Catholic. We're not conservative, we're not liberal, we're kind of just trying to make it work. <laughs> we're not, you know, we don't believe in transubstantiation, but we don't deny that Jesus is really present in the communion somehow. We're kind of in the middle. We're, that is the Anglican response to everything. We take the two extremes and we find the middle ground because fundamentally we are about how do we worship together. Now, how that works in a mission field and in an ecclesiology where you're trying to win people in a sense to the faith, another question that we're still probably going to work out over the next hundred years. But as I talked about at the beginning, when we come back to the questions of the early church, what did the early church look like? It looked like a lot of arguments and a lot of disagreements about how the church should be, how it should work, how it should think, how it should believe, uh, as both the Holy, at least in my understanding of it, as both the Holy Spirit and Christ sort of guided this organisation and this group of people to a clearer understanding of who he is and what he wants to do. It takes time. And so we are in a messy stage uh, of the, the life of the church. So as I kind of close off to that, and the key question to me to, tonight is, what about Anglican devotion in worship? Do you love? And what do you struggle with? So this, it's not just a rhetorical question. Uh, if you've got your points, I'd love to be able to talk about them. You're also welcome to go, though, and <laughs> start that, because it is getting kind of later. But in terms of what we've talked about today, has it helped to explain some of the idiosyncrasies <laughs> of the Anglican movement? I love the scripture, but I struggle with the application. Or it just contracts me in a lot, a lot of what um, we do on a, on a weekly basis. 
Yeah, so, sorry, I missed the start of that. I love the scripture. Yep. I love the scripture. I think, you know, a, a lot of this one, I suppose, I went straight to what, what you know, leaving aside, in fact, the, uh, the particular the languages that translated what was going on, how people were actually living and evidencing a life in Christ. But I think a lot of us, and of course, who I'm in, there was no out, come to church, and you, you preach on this, you know, come to church once a week and live a totally different life. And I, um, I struggle with that. I, I struggle with people, myself as well, when I don't actually live the word. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that, that is, uh, I mean, it's definitely true. Anglican, uh, Anglican, Little Rose, you yeah. find a compromise to realize that not every, and to your point, not a, in, in um, anthropology, not everyone will be a leader, not everyone mm. will do something. And the natural gravity will have people doing what they're comfortable with, people. Mm. I think it's a lovely model, and I think um, it, it's its beauty is that it actually it has application today. As you often say, it, it's it's right in point today. I couldn't see more prejudice in, in what we've just had, mm. or more moving away in America, where where the focus is very much about personal advancement, personal positions, than than a connectivity to God. Mm. Yep. So I love it. I love it, and I struggle with. Yep. How we live it. Yep. And so I think um, there is a degree, like if probably the best way I've come to explain it is that I think Anglican devotion, at least in its practice and its sort of emphasis on what we actually teach, which is that belonging is kind of really important, it's still held captive by the fact that we are predominantly formed as consumers, which is that um, we, we fundamentally approach almost everything with a question of what is. What is this doing for me? What am I getting out of this? And so long as that question or that kind of attitude is lying behind our faith, it makes it extraordinarily hard to actually practice it in, in, in the real world. Because fundamentally, I, throughout church history, em, embodied faith is always sacrificial. It, it, Every single place it's been expressed, it's been sacrificial. It's been a sacrifice of your safety, it's been a sacrifice of your security, of your financial position, it's been a sacrifice of your health, uh, it's been a sacrifice constantly. Like, I mean, we look at the early church and sort of look at the Greco Roman world, um, and we did absolutely win over entire cities by caring for the sick and the dying. But we also died <laughs> because we did that. Um, so every Christian that was won was met by one that died because they stuck with the plague victim um, and nursed them. So there's this reality that actually Christian faith, when lived fully, is deeply sacrificial. So, so what that means is that the human part of it, in fact, actually has a, has a life experience. It doesn't change the faith. No. The, 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 the fact that it doesn't change, that, that if we take the human out of it, that that should not be the model. That's not the line. Mm. It's, yeah. not, it's not to say that I live that. But no, it's no, but it, it's 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 there, which is the it's the it's the aspiration of the system in a sense. If you want to get a real technical language of it, it's it's what we're trying to create. <laughs> but it's there's a lot of cultural factors that definitely make it harder because we don't tend to approach it with a how do I give myself to this? It's it, I, this is a more generalized thing, which is the church in the West tends to approach religion as a what do I get out of this, and and often that is I get eternal life. Maybe or I maybe, get something, I get this. Yeah. Maybe what you said beautifully summed it up is that one by the middle road. Yeah. Recognizing yeah. recognizing that we're human. Yeah. And recognizing that you can't get an idea. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is a degree to which it's meeting the human need for what we probably fundamentally say is meaning and purpose. Yeah. Um, meeting that with a meaning and purpose that's actually sort of superhuman, which is beyond us really. It's 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 the it's the greater calling. So in that respect it's yeah, the middle road is a beautiful thing. Um, but unfortunately in the Anglican Church often it's a, a middle road. We, we talk about this still like in Reformation language and we say that the Anglican is the middle road between Reformed and Catholic or something like that. Nobody cares. <laughs> no one's that passionate about that stuff anymore. But it's, we do care about the fact that culturally our problem at the moment is the consumeristic attitude versus a kind of a desire for a greater meaning. And you know, to use the model of Anglican worship or Anglican ecclesiology to bring it go, well, let's meet them. I think we can both in one way or another. So I, I have
have to admit what I struggle with in terms of Anglican practice and devotion is often it's lifeless. Um, not, not always, but in my experience of some people leading liturgy, and because they lead it for long enough, the congregation kind of picks up the vibe, it's just soulless. It, it often is just read verbatim. Um, and I mean, I, I don't want to name people because it would be unfair, but certainly some people who come and lead worship in our church every now and then, you, you will hear them just prattle it off so quickly that it, it's the aesthetic of it, the, the kind of the appearances of it or the ritual of it appear to dominate the meaning of it. Um, and I really struggle with that. But unfortunately, it's a, it's a bit of an inherent problem with the way that we do worship, which is that when it's a consistent series of words, repetition either makes something extremely meaningful or it very quickly makes it meaningless. And, it, and it's the kind of perils of liturgy. Um, it either makes it even more, more important or it makes it feel less and less important or meaningful in terms of the... That's why I find really hard when things are just rattled off. Mm -hmm. And I find it hard too, and I don't want to knock things, but when we have our prayer time sometimes, it's almost as if the readings are just... Um, and I know that people are really busy and mm -hmm. lots on, but sometimes I, I just would love to just be able to spend a little bit of time just waiting on the Lord and allowing Him to. Mm. It's yep. just, I just, I guess it's just the background of what I, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the yeah the Angl Anglicans. We have got a history of the kind of more contemplative that side. I mean, it's not quite contemplative, but it have got a history of it, but it tends to be in the monastic spaces, whereas congregationally, Anglican worship has typically been filled with words. Um, beautiful words, but yes. filled with words. And many Presbyterian churches, mm. as you were saying, it's yeah. been just rattled it, off too. And it's you know. often, part of it is the fact that we are a product of the culture we're in, which is certainly yeah. in the last sort of 100 years, it's been very intellectual. And so words are the means of articulating ideas and concepts and thoughts. So we think shoving words out there, whether in form of liturgy or prayer or whatever it might be, will, will solve the problem. Um, but I think you're right in terms of that. Yeah, and I have to watch myself because I think having been at Faith Bible College and went to the mission, where we did spend a lot of time mm. waiting on the Lord, then, you know, and, yeah. and I, I realise that the church is... Yeah, I mean, there's, the yeah, there's always the slightly balance. different cultures and, and sort yeah. of movements versus community gathered church, but it's, yeah. um, yeah. I mean, right. Mission Mission's not a church, no. and Faith Bible College is not a church. Yeah. Uh, they're just interdenominational, but um, it does tend to mould you a bit. Yeah, it does. Your, um, it shapes how you yeah. look at those questions, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the, this is sort of the more ironic side of it, one of the beauties I do have, I love about the Anglican Church is that no matter how bad the service is, you kind of know it's going to come to an end. You know when it's going to come to an end. <laughs> so you, you can kind of get practiced enough that, you know, the sermon's finished, and you know that that certain part of the Eucharist now, or that, that part of the, yeah. the prayer after communion, and you kind of, okay, we're, we're moving. <laughs> Whereas some sort of churches you go to, you kind of, you never really know where you're at. Like, you feel like it could be winding down. But then actually we're going to sing four more hymns and then we're going to have another sermon in the offertory. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So there is, I mean, it's a very human thing, but it's, um, there is something quite comforting in knowing, I mean, it's probably part of the reason I'm Anglican, it's comforting knowing that I know where I'm at. <laughs> and mostly, not always, but mostly in the Presbyterian Church, we let our sermon time to be preached for 20 minutes. Mm. Depends on the preacher yeah, in the sermon. Depends what they're bringing. Yeah, so. absolutely. Then you get a bit strict on it, but um, yeah. Anyone else show any loves or struggles with Anglican devotion? Excellent. All right. Well, I'll close us in prayer, and then we'll.
gracious God, we give you thanks that we are formed into a faith that is not mere brand new on this earth, but rather has been tried and tested by so many generations. We thank you for the wisdom that they have left to us, the wisdom that is captured in our scripture, the wisdom that is captured in our practice, the wisdom that is captured in what it looks like to do life together as a church. We thank you for the particular way in which you have shaped the Church of the English, um, the church that has become this Anglican movement around the world. We thank you for that underlying sense of concern for belonging, uh, and how we do life together. We thank you for the way in which that has helped people who held deeply held convictions to find spaces of compromise and of peace. We thank you that it has helped to, in the best moments, lift us above our own human problems and our own human disagreements to the greater glory that you carry. We pray for the expression of that church in this country and as well as in this place and in this church here. May you continue to guide us through your Holy Spirit, that as we seek and strive to discover how it is that you wish us to practice our faith and practice our life as church in the world today, that you will guide us graciously, that you will give us that discernment and courage to take the steps that are needed, and that we may continue to be shaped by that desire that as many as possible may come along. Bless us as we go from this place. Bless us in the journeys that are before us. Bless us in the sleep that this evening will give them. We ask for your travelling graces as we offer you all of these prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. I do think this is a very <laughs> it's, it's, it's got a pretty interesting history this one actually in terms of not just um, I, I'm not leading I think there is I think I saw um, uh, what's it? Joy 